So I don't often descend into the bowels of online comment sections, but I do like engaging with the people on our website, mainly because you pay our wages and some of you have some very insightful takes. Good and, people. And so uh, many such cases, some I assume are good people. And, and so I, I recently had a chat with Helen Joyce, as you can see on our website. And this is, this is free, but of course, if you do become a paying member, you can ensure that we can pay for the expenses and all this fancy equipment so we can keep having these conversations. And Helen and I had a really cordial conversation. She knew coming in, it was a bit like a lion's den because she knew that that we probably wouldn't agree on everything. We would agree on the diagnosis, but not the trajectory of travel, which is why we had a broad discussion about whether or not the TERFs, the trans exclusion radical feminists, which she is friends with, she doesn't identify herself as that. She still thinks of herself as fiscally conservative, socially liberal, which I think is an oxymoron. But when she comes back, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll hash more of that stuff out. And if folks like us, the more reactionary types, can remain allies after we put woke away. And it was a really constructive conversation. But towards the end, in the last 10 minutes, we had quite a lot of comments that weren't happy with some of the things that, that she said. Now, we did post this to YouTube, but then we had to take it down because of YouTube's terms of service because they don't like biology. But you can watch this in full on our website. And in the last 10 minutes, one of the things she said was that men are kind of useless. Now, I don't suppose you've watched this interview yet. No, I haven't yet. Out of context, that sounds bad. And yeah. some of the comments here, I won't read out because a bit of swearing, but some of the comments here took a uncharitable oh. interpretation because I think we've heard the term sexist or we've heard misandric rhetoric so often that our ears prick up and it's either boy who cried wolf or we immediately categorize those people as enemies because they might still be holding on to some liberal presuppositions. Yeah, they usually are. That, yes. that is true. So I'm going to play the clip in context and then we're going to discuss whether or not men are useless and what she actually meant by it because I think there's a lot of dispossessed men who feel denigrated in our, in our audience they need speaking to and I don't think they should be put down but I also don't think that getting this angry at someone who might be persuaded and on our side is the way to go so let's press play I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a heterosexual woman I'm married, I have two sons you know, I have five brothers I'm really not anti-men No, no, and, I've, I've never and, had that impression and, you know, I do look at young men and think, gosh, you, you know, I mean, men are just a bit useless compared with women. I mean, historically and through evolution, in the sense that men are disposable. Like the thing that men give to the next generation is it's very substitutable and you don't need very many men. And, you know, women are much more precious. Like if you look at a tribal group, the precious thing is the fertile women and the babies. That's, that's, the, um, that's the resource in a pre-money society. Men are not the resource. And that's why, you know, men are corralled into going out and fighting and, you know, their, their blood's wasted in wars and so on. I often wonder how Freud couldn't have noticed that. Like the idea that women envy penises, obviously men envy wombs, for goodness sake. Like that's the scarce resource in humanity is, is reproductive capacity and it's women's. And that's why women, men have liked to control it. Um, so young men have always had to be given a purpose and a reason and a way to become men because women don't need that because it's obvious how we do it. Um, and every time I say these things, people misquote me and say, I think that a woman doesn't matter if she's not a mother. Please put in all those disclaimers. I'm just talking about sort of archetypes here in the way that societies are laid out. So yes, yeah, so a lot of cultures try to find some way to make men feel like men. Because there isn't a natural, you don't like becoming a father is not like becoming a mother. And we don't do that. And we tell young men that what makes you a successful man, like, is things that are just very hard to achieve. Like, we've got rid of a lot of the things that used to be participation ways of feeling good about yourself for both men and women, but it matters more for men, I think. You know, if you've got rid of the church, you haven't got ways of just being part of the, the way that your church does stuff, which you don't have to be particularly good at. You just have to show up. Um, we've uh, foolishly, in my opinion, told young men that they don't need to look after mothers and children. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm always amazed now when I see young men not get up for a pregnant woman on the train or not help people with their shopping or help people with their buggies or whatever. It's always women who help you. It's not men. But, you know, men have to be told that there's a purpose. They have to be given a purpose. I don't know if you need an initiation ritual, but that needs some thought. And we're not doing that thinking. We're leaving men to be quite useless and aimless. 
I mean, I'm not against men only spaces because I think, you know, there are places, there are times that men want to be with other men. So, did you get any contempt from any of that? Certainly no contempt. No, I agreed with like 97.5% of it. There was a little bit that I disagreed with that, that she made a comment about um, uh, men need to be given purpose. Do they, or, or do they need to go out and find their purpose? And, and there's something in society which is blocking that. You know, I, I might have some wobble around that bit, but actually, the rest of it, and the, the bit about men being, um, well, w- whether it's useless, but you know, they are the evolutionary bottleneck. They are the com- precious resource. I mean, certainly, yeah. If, if you are in a um, pre-industrialized society, absolutely, you want to protect your women more than your men, because, well, quite frankly, you can repopulate the entire village with one man, but you can't do it with one woman. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I, I didn't take issue with any of that, apart from possibly the bit about how a man comes into his own. Yes. So, so the, what prompted that discussion was actually a question about whether or not men have had their participation rituals and the stages at which you can call yourself a man deracinated and removed from them. Oh, yeah. So there's yeah. a lack of male-only spaces, for example. There's a lack of gun clubs. The Scouts is now unisex. Lots of sports clubs are, uh, have significantly less funding. Um, there's uh, schooling is skewed particularly towards a female way of learning and there's a lack of male teachers there's a lack of male mental figures within popular culture there's a lack of fathers generally because 50 percent of kids in the uk are split between two households some rarely see their dad some have never because well, a lot of women are marrying the state now there's a, they don't need men for that exactly and and so when can you call yourself a man you're not in proximity to danger you're not looking after a dependent you don't always have yes. a father figure hanging over you. And all of those, those men, there's lots of men that don't have families, don't reproduce, yeah. either never will or later and later haven't. There aren't any vocations for them like she brought up the church, like the priesthood, for example, where they can serve the role of a father culturally without having their own children. All those things are stripped from them. And so what, what I think Helen was actually saying there is that when she said men are a bit useless, what she meant is even evolutionarily, some of them are superfluous. So culture, oh, yeah. is, culture is a safety net that gives those men who aren't killed off in a war yeah. and who don't have their own children direction. So they don't launch a revolution against the civilization. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen stats that suggest that, you know, throughout the, the entirety of human history. So we, we're talking about the, you know, the, um, you know, the stone age as well, but throughout the entirety of human history, something like 80% of men had died violent deaths. Um, wh- whereas that is a significantly lower n- number for women. But yeah, and, and, and it leads through to the genetic data, which suggests that we have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. Well, that's, that's this. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. so I actually decided to bring that up. So here's, a, here's some research from eight years ago now. Uh, these are researchers in Germany, and they said, imagine if a population of 100 females and 100 males, if all the females but only one of the males reproduce, then while the males and females contribute 50-50 to the next generation, the male contribution is just from one male. The next generation would have the same Y chromosome, but 100 different sets of mitochondrial DNA, which is passed solely down the maternal line. So the majority of women get to reproduce, but some men reproduce with more than one woman because he might remarry or he might have concubines. Well, I mean, that's represented in in modern dating as well. Yes. Yeah, it's the golden penis syndrome that you see on university. Uh, yeah, yeah. Campuses yeah where, where women are sharing a small number of um, high value men because yes. it's, it's, it's programmed into them to do that. Yeah, there's a Pareto principle when it comes to yeah. mating. And also, because a woman's fertility cycle is more embodied, it means that they are a more, and because their eggs are limited, it means that their path to womanhood is more set in stages. They don't have to have those participation rituals as yes. men do culturally. And yeah. they have a more scarce resource because they have a shorter window of time in which they can actually have children. And the gestational period is very long and, and physically risky. Yeah, on, on, on that sense, they certainly need to get their shit together. Yes, yeah. yes. And so what in other times would happen is that women would set fair standards for the men to have their stuff together in order to have exclusive sexual access to them. The standards yeah. going askew is a lot of why men are feeling purposeless and without relationships. This, this is the women just are, but men have to become. Yes. And that is that is so important. Men have to become, but we have set up a society where we're basically trying to make it impossible for men to become, and well, we we punish them for for not displaying feminine traits. Yes, and and this is where I think that she was making the Freudian penis envy argument from. Right. One, she was alluding to, um, the particular group in dresses that we can't talk about on YouTube. Yes, but the board, oh yeah, we really can't, can we? No, we we're not allowed to. But you. Judging by Helen's work, you know exactly the group she was talking about. Yes. But the other thing that she was talking about is the fact that women have, they front load their social value and yeah. the, the things they can accrue without having to work for them just by being young and pretty and fertile. 
Yep. They get that from a much earlier age at the point where men get basically nothing. This is the message of Andrew Tate that resonates with some young men of that the universe is apathetic to your existence until you prove yourself. And so there is not womb envy there, but there is a little bit of feeling it is unfair when civilization says not only are women systemically oppressed by men, so we have to give them the leg up, but also biologically, women front load their value and get lots of free things before men can even work to achieve them. So I understand why. Yeah. I'm not actually condoning some of the language used, but I understand why there's that bubbling resentment there in reaction to what Helen said. They just might be misidentifying it because yeah. there's lots of men that are resentful of how civilization is rigged against them, both naturally, biologically, and culturally in saying that, oh, if you've achieved something as a young man, you're actually just furthering patriarchal oppression. So we should take all that away from you. Yeah, and, and, and um, I don't know if you want to mention it here, but I'm still blown away by that, by that book that you handed me today. Um, you know, women, women just don't realize quite what it's like. Oh, Nor, Nora Vincent's yeah. Self-Made Man. We'll be covering that at some point in the, in the book club, but Nora Vincent was a lesbian who masqueraded as a man for 18 months. She didn't have gender dysphoria. In, in fact, she wrote against it and was cancelled by the, the LGBTQ plus LMNOP community. She got so depressed by her time as a man that years later she went and got euthanized. And part of the catalyst that was, she spent some time dating women while disguised as a man. And she felt that men unilaterally had to front the risk for interacting with women. Yeah. And they were regarded with contempt just for approaching the women, which discouraged them from ever approaching them. But the women also wanted to be approached. So there's this constant paradox where the man takes on all of the risk, but the reward is unilateral. But the women, because they're risk averse, understandably, because they don't know the motivations of men who might be stronger and, and creepier mm. than them. Um, women will self-sabotage by not being approachable. And so she's like, this is, this is a constant thing that men have to navigate. It's, it's an impossible tightrope walk but where I've got to approach you, but I've got to be somehow exactly the type of man you want before I approach you, but I don't know that until I approach you. Yeah. And so you might just hate my existence for giving it an earnest Yeah, and in previous generations, we got around that by getting very drunk in bars. Um, but, but Zoomers don't do that these days, so it's Zoomers. even harder. No, they rarely drink. And also yes. the way dating apps are set up, actually discourages yeah. you from getting I'm, I'm thinking of doing a segment on that soon because I've, I've started looking at it and um, yes it's not good yeah well actually speaking of dating preferences here Rob Henderson's broken down the data I'll be talking to Rob at some point on the podcast and he said about 6 in 10 young men are single 18 to 29 uh, among young women little less than half are single Pew Research Survey in 2019 said that men 18 to, uh, 18 to 29 reported being single um, half of them, and women, the figure was 32%. So from 2019 to 2023, singlehood among young men increased 51% to 57%. For women, it increased in 32% to 45%. But even though they're increasing, more than half of single men, that's 52%, are saying they're interested in dating, but only 36% of women. So lots of women that are single are choosing to remain single and elongate those years. So not only are women dating a fewer selection pool of men, they're rating 80% of them as below average attractiveness, but there's also a disproportionate number of men wanting to get into relationships but being barred from relationships by those women. Yeah, and, and then they, they're basically going to wait until their prime years are over and then expect one of these guys that they basically ignored to then provide for them. Yeah. And so, a nasty shock when he's like too blackpilled. Exactly. So you, you need men not just to yeah. have kids with, but also to look after you when you've got those kids and to look after you when you're a hell of a lot older and you're not able to climb the ladder to reach the top shelf and things like that. But you need men for that. Um, also, you need men to keep up civilization. So there's fatal employment statistics here. So this is from the US Bureau of Labor. This was a couple of years ago. And I just like the framing from, from Forbes here. They looked at the annual census of fatal occupational injuries, looking at 139 sec separate occupations and discrete industries. An obvious pattern quickly emerges. The safest workspaces are indoors, and the safest occupations frequently require education beyond high school. The most deadly occupations, on the other hand, are outside and often involve operating equipment. This largely drives the huge difference in workplace fatalities between men and women, with 4,761 men dying on the job compared to 386 women in 2017. Now, the latest figures in 2022, this was women were 8.6% of all workplace fatalities. So that's men making up 91.4%. Mm. Um, and they, they genuinely say this is surprising. They say in this article, it's a surprising disparity. And this is only surprising if you get all of your worldview from Marvel movies where women are, are just as strong, but that's fine. But the four most dangerous occupations are commercial fishing, logging, aircraft pilots, and roofers. Now, the reason that men are important is because you don't see the feminists demanding equal access to deep sea trawling. No. And the reason is that's, that's a difficult, yeah, it's, demanding it's, it's occupation. Yeah, it's only equal access to the jobs that they, they decided they want. Yeah, the unisex avenues of wealth and power as well. So ultimately, yes. feminism serves regime interests because it liquidates you down to the unisex individual consumer. 
atomized yes. and having no family, um, which is also what you need men for. But but all right, I, I understand that people were therefore a bit mad when they picked up on men being useless because even though she didn't mean useless in the sense that the regime says useless, well of course men uphold civilization. They're taking all of these dangerous jobs. You need yeah. Them. Well, when they're allowed to, yeah. Well, yeah, well, exactly. But they're still reliant on them for the time being until they're replaced by robots. Um, there's also the, the uselessness of men that she raised. They are just sent off to, to fight and die in wars. And this is an article by, uh, by Freya India, who's been on the podcast, interview with her coming out soon. Funnily enough, did you know that, that female leaders wage war more often than men? Well, we're sort of seeing that at least today, aren't we? The Victoria Newland effect. Yes. Because we had this dialogue for ages that if, if women were in charge of things, there'd be less wars. And then it, when, as soon as you look at the numbers, and especially today, it's like the complete opposite. Yeah, for, for about 500 years, so 1480 to 1913, yeah. this was University of Chicago research, they found European queens were 27% more likely to wage war than kings. And I think yes. the reason is, is because they know they're sending the men off to fight and die, so they're distanced from the consequences. Well, yeah, this is, this is the sort of upscale version of the, of the drunk girl in the bar trying to get her bar for, uh, her boyfriend into a fight kind of thing. Exactly, yes. Yeah. yes. She's insulated from the physical repercussions of her actions, whereas men understand, because most yeah. interactions are undergirded by the threat of force if you take it too far, yeah. exactly. But any, any violent exchange has the significance to be very serious, even if, you don't, even if it doesn't necessarily look that way from the outset. Exactly. And so, so all of those are the reasons why we need men, but why are people sensitive about the devaluing of men? Well, um, their, their social circles have basically gone extinct. So 30 years ago, a majority of men, 55%, reported having at least six close friends. That number's cut in half. Uh, this is as of 2021. Slightly more than one in four, that's 27% men, um, have six or more close friends. But 15% say they have no friendships at all. That's a five-fold increase since 1990. So there's plenty of lonely men out there. There's also men that just don't have relationships. Uh, women are now outclassing them in college degrees at about nearly 6%, 60% of college degrees. Nearly half of them say that they earn more or the same as their husbands if they're, if they're married. Uh, a survey at the Brookings Institute found that US parents, regardless of political affiliation, are now more worried about their sons than their daughters because the sons are failing in education attainment, they're failing in friendship, they're failing um, in, in, in their careers. And the re part of the reason is marriage over the last five decades has dropped by 60%, but cohabitation is going up. So people are treating each other as, as fungible economic opportunities that you can trade up at, at any particular time. And uh, relative to men, a large percentage of women are saying that not being able to find someone who meets their expectations is the major reason they're single. Women's expectations are misskewed and they are undervaluing men. And so they're not happy either. There's a lot I could say on that, but I won't. There are, there are some perverse incentives. I'll, I'll right? save my thoughts on that one. At, at work here that isn't serving anyone. And so this is why US suicides have hit an all-time high. Yeah. Uh, it's particularly pronounced among white men, according to the CDC. Uh, deaths rose nearly 7% in ages 45 to 64, and 8% in people 65 and older. This was nearly 50,000 people that died last year. And from the ASFP, they've looked at the stats and, and why this is increasing. The age-adjusted suicide rate in 2021 was 14.04 per 100,000. The rate of suicide is highest among middle-aged white men. That's adjusted as well. The, the times that are most prominent are when they get divorced, so they lose their jobs. So the avenues of purpose are going extinct for men. Uh, in 2021, men died by suicide 3.9 times more than women. There are 132 suicides a day. White men accounted to 69.68% of suicide deaths. And uh, firearms did 54% did of that. So again, more, more manufactured consent for the Democrat machine to rob you of something that lets you protect your family. So great, great stuff. There's going to be no calls to equalize these stats, I, I'd imagine. No. And, and so this is why, and I'll, I'll finish on this. This is why there was a bubbling of aversive sentiment to something that, that Helen had said, even though I think she yeah. was actually being sympathetic to men by saying history has treated us as generally superfluous yeah. and it, because there hasn't been a war because the atomic bomb has cut us all and institutionalized risk because there's no nobility for fighting and dying for a, for a higher cause now or even just the brutality of trench warfare there's a hell of a lot of men that are just sort of lingering about without wives girlfriends father figures mentors um, upward social mobility and vocations that allow them and to the serve. And the entire society around them is trying to design them out of the process. Yes. Well, uh, when I went on Piers Morgan, I was told it's actually good that men are terrified of a false accusation. That is, that is the, <laughs> the devouring feminine spirit of, of, of endless henpecking. So even if you try and struggle upwards and try and have a relationship with someone, you mm. will be kicked down and in the face. And, and so I, I see the anguish that, that men are experiencing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this all requires really sincere um, uh, solutions, vocations, and cultural change. But my, my only statement here will be, and I know I'll be chewed up in the YouTube comments for this as blue-pilled and whatever, but I don't think the resentment is serving you, lads. And the reason is, 
when these particular women would like us to remove perverts from their segregated spaces, I'll put it that way, who are they going to call? Women have married the state. It's not good. It's going to be up to men to physically remove them. It's going to be up to men to lead the idea revolution that brings these women back towards tradition, particularly when the hard times hit. And so if we are just resentful, we are serving the regime interests that would like us to be atomized, unisex, and against each other. The, the, the more you resent women, because we're in the sibling economy where we're more like Cain and Abel than Adam and Eve, the more you do that, the more you play into their dialectic. What you need to be is not resentful. What you need to be is accept that some people might still have liberal sensibilities that they're bitterly clinging onto, but that if we're more inviting, they might be more convinced by reality and the fact that we are good, virtuous men who will lead them out of this problem. And then when they need us, well, they're, they're going to ask. So be, be the kind of man that they can be reliable, uh, they can, that you are reliable enough that they can call on you when a crisis strikes. So well, we are in our civilization's moment of crisis right now. Yes. And, and it's the old meme, hard times create strong men. You know, you, you should be going through this period being a stronger man because of it. Yes. So men aren't useless, especially when we're strong. If you enjoyed that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, why not visit our website where you can get the podcast live, in full, uncensored, and for free from one o'clock UK time every weekday. And while you're there, for as little as five pounds a month, you can get access to all of our premium content. For example, Dan's series Brokenomics, where he and Carl discuss the observable managed decline in our civilization. And if you'd like to see what the rest of us are putting out, you can follow Dan at, at KingBingo underscore on Twitter and at Lotus Eaters underscore on Twitter. Until next time, goodbye.